civil engineering bkit welcomes you all to the second day of webinar on design and construction of steel structures i welcome today's speaker mr n basu ceo of bce design service llp to this webinar welcome you sir thank you very much i Good welcome enough. I have welcome Dr. C S Shashi Kumar, HOD of Department of Civil Engineering, BKIT, and also the faculties of Civil Engineering, BKIT. And I welcome all the participants to the webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Mr. N Basu. Mr. Nilanjan Basu, uh, BE Civil in and ME Structures, and he is a structural engineer having more than 23 years of experience in design and construction. He has worked in diverse projects involving design and detailing of RCC steel and composite structures. He proficiency domain ranges from steel plants to cement plants, oil refineries, airports, and and multiplexes, etc. He worked in companies like Jacobs Engineering Institute for Steel Development and Growth before starting his own company that is BCE Design Service LLP formerly known as Basu Consulting Engineers in 2007 His people are well versed with US British and European codes which helps them deal with projects all over the world At BCE he encourages the use of multiple software packages such as RAM structural, STAD, RISA 3D, ETAPS, SAFE, etc., in order to avoid stereotype design. BCE also specializes in blast-resistant design of structure and has an affinity to accept challenging tasks. He has authored engineering design publication along with textbooks on basic C++ and Java. He hopes to encourage future engineers to take up the challenges of building a better India through their knowledge. It's our pleasure to have you here, sir. Now we will turn the time over to the speaker, Mr. N. Basu. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for the beautiful introduction, um, speaker. Uh, good morning, everyone. And this is Nilanjan Basu. Um, I my I have my masters in structural engineering and we I come from this company of mine around 14 years back uh, since then we've been working on uh, diverse projects uh, all over the world so a segment of that works with the US projects and uh, a second uh, another segment works with the Middle East projects and and the third segment works on Indian projects which are mostly industrial um the affinity towards steel actually started off with my career when i was working with instac um and uh, mr samanto being one of my role models for actually introducing steel um very coldly in my heart um he has been actively uh, supporting and promoting and uh, teaching structures for a long time he um, he also happened to be my first mentor for uh, steel in in instac So thank you, Mr. Shamanta, for this opportunity. It's a pleasure for me to present my case studies, all the case studies on steel structures which we have done over here. Um, to all the fellow members and everyone over here present, uh, good morning. Um, today, uh, I'll be working mostly and I'll be speaking mostly about the steel structures we've already done in our company. So we have a proficiency of steel structures and. Uh, blast proof structures blast resistant structures so generally blast resistant structures are uh, generally a part of two two main thing either defense or uh, for the oil refineries these are the two main segments where blast resistant structures are required so and steel structures um, in india uh, have gained a real lot, lot of prominence in the last 5 years or rather 7 years uh, where people from all segments of the of indian con- country are actually going in for steel construction um we specialize with steel concrete composite construction in various modes uh, be it uh, pv be it on site construction so today i will be uh, taking up my lecture on pv uh, which actually defines as a pre engineered building the pv term came into uh, uh, being when actually we were at Uh, conceptualizing the warehouses that's how pe became and when off site construction that is not on site off site construction became a big prom- uh, big uh, um, mode of advantage 
on site uh, space was a constraint people could not um, fabricate on site so then that came into being where off site most of the entire structure would be fabricated off site and the site would be used for um, just the erection purpose so that's the whole concept of peb but of course as and when with time the peb design methodology the dpb uh, planning methodology everything changed and today we are now with the most advanced of the technology helping pb to gain huge prominence um it actually uh, it not only saves the working space on site but i also makes uh, erection and also the construction much faster um i have a small presentation which i will be presenting i'll take my i'll switch off my video so that the transmission is faster so uh, may i present i can share my screen yes yes niran you start it okay i can just us uh, I hope this is visible to everyone. Um, can can just someone respond? Yes, to yes, 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 sir, yes, sir. Okay. yes, it is visible. Thank you very much. So, um, yes, as I mentioned today, I'll be taking up uh, the BB construction. Uh, some of, one of the case studies, rather two of my case studies, one in Indian, one uh, a US based case study. So, <clears throat> the whole point of this uh, the presentation is that. Uh, just to make you aware what happens while well it's not about only about the designing part what happens when you actually uh, are going in for a pv based construction um yesterday <clears throat> mr shilaita chandra delivered a good lecture on the design aspects of pv uh, quite a detailed one so uh, in continuation to his uh, um, uh, lecture this is a uh, just the next part of the design so <clears throat> whatever pictures you're seeing over here are all projects which are been done in house by a company again let me tell you we are a company which works um on industrial in all the indian projects all are in most of the indian projects are industrial uh again the us based projects are buildings and commercial so whatever pictures you are seeing uh, five uh, four out of five are us projects and one of them on the bottom right hand corner where it's written globe that's the indian uh, project kolkata based it's a steel pro steel construction um, and that's the case study i'm going to pre present today so because site site space was a constraint in this whole uh, project and just to share how we actually planned the whole thing and how we actually implemented the construction and facilitated for easy construction over there okay so coming back let's go on to the move slide so first just giving you a brief because there are a lot of college students and i believe who are part who are uh, uh, part of the participants over here for them just to make you understand uh, there are five categories of uh, modernization which have actually dominated in the last 20 years number one we have actually moved on to green building concept number two uh, we have enhanced the design softwares and enhanced just doesn't mean added features we have actually integrated them with detailing with site with project management so well that all these softwares are very versatile with uh, any category of design and construction together coming to the third one it's detailing softwares earlier 2d was the mode of uh, detailing now 3d is the mode of detailing where it's just not about detailing but also about uh, checking for clashes with other services like mep um, electricals plumbing ducts everything and so the 3d model consists of uh, all so all these uh, uh, components and uh, the clash checks are done uh, uh, with the structural elements so that the structural depth structural arrangements can be changed in real time the fourth one of the biggest uh, uh, thing we have adopted even in our company is cloud computing and i'll explain what is cloud computing as and when we progress fifth the ultimate is the bim modeling everything in the world almost all the major projects in the world 
they are actually focusing on uh, and actually executing using the BIM modeling. That's B B I M stands for building information modeling. So if the model will consist of every single information a project requires, starting from vendors, sections, who's the purchaser, where is the section, the, the um, time of installation, everything. The BIM modeling consists of everything. So whenever you click on any component in any structure, you'll be able to see all the details and the project management schedule, everything. So that's BIM modeling. So what is green building? So basically green buildings, I'll just give you some features of green building. What is this? So you, when you have the glazings, you know, you look at all these uh, co commercial office spaces, you have the beautiful glazing structures, but then the glazing with the low ultraviolet factor is it's actually one of the features of the green building. So uh, it's just not just to resist the sun, but also to emit or uh, reflect the ultraviolet rays and just ingress only a low uh, category of ultraviolet rays inside the building. Roof insulation, you can just go in for um, insulating your roof with different parameters, just now again, not to reflect the heat, but also to absorb the heat, also to take the energy from that heat and then convert it into essentially working almost like a solar panel. It's not installing solar panels, but the roof are converted into almost like a solar panel grids. Then it comes the low flow of sanitary. Uh, uh, Nilanjor, sorry to disturb you. I think slide is not moving. Sorry? Slide is not moving. It's that not moving. Is... I'm not moving the slide. Oh, I'm just explaining. Okay. 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 So basically, so I'm just explaining some of the features of green building. You know, you have the rainwater harvesting, the recycled use of landscape, the solar power. These are part of the green buildings. Coming to design softwares, we have the design softwares like STAD, RAM Structural, Riza 3D, RSTAB, ETABS, RCDC, SAVE, etc. And there's the Global and every uh, lot of softwares which are available now. It's just not uh, focusing on even one. Detailing softwares like you have the AutoCAD, um, ZWCAD, GSTARCAD, these are all the 2D uh, softwares. And then when you come to the 3D, it's Tecla, Pro Structures, Revit, SDS2 various uh, 3D um, detailing softwares. Uh, cloud computing, I will explain uh, a little later. BIM modeling, as I exp explained, it's called the information modeling. So now, okay, this is a model, cloud computing model for the projects we have uh, with us and we always follow this. So number one is that the first and the biggest authority is the client. And then we have the project management system, project management, and then the cloud server. Um, so what is the uh, cloud server and what is the project management? Basically, so the client has two components. One is the consultant, one is the contractor, one is the design engineering, and the, the, uh, which consultants will follow the design engineering and the detail engineering path. And the contractor will have the construction, material, and equipments, and then the site progress. And then together, we complete the projects, right? But then earlier days, what we used to do is the consultants used to do the design, send it to the client, uh, send it to the client. Client has its own consultant or also the con contractor. The contractor checks the design, says the availability of material, gives the comment, and then uh, gives it back to the consultant, gives it back to the client, client to the consultant. So in the process, a lot of time is wasted. Nowadays, we don't do that. There's a central body called the project management body. So the, everything is rooted to that. And the project management just doesn't work on paper. So the whole thing works on a paperless module where we call the cloud server. Every part of the design is getting updated real time on the cloud server. Your detailing, your design, your uh, documentation, everything is getting updated on cloud server. And at the same time, real time, intimations, messages are going to the contractor. If the contract is required for checking, same messages are going to the contractor that there's a new update on this particular document. Please check, recheck and send it back. The contractor reset, checks the whole thing, sends it back to the cloud server. The cloud server is accessible by project management team, the consultant team, the contracting team. Everyone is, has access to the cloud server. And it's just not about the intimation. So there is a real time uh, checking of what's going on. So that's about the design part. So construction, what about the real time construction process? So what happens is, let's say I plan out um, a particular steel uh, column, uh, three, four, or three or four construction of columns today. And I need a construction uh, boom, a site, uh, a jig and a boom for that. 
for let's say the boom uh, uh, machine operator is uh, uh, unavailable that particular day. So what happens is that that information is a real time updated on the cloud server, the project management team, the design engineering team immediately gets to know that and they they can really reroute that and say that fair enough, don't follow the column. If you can go in for the concrete casting for this particular columns, let's finish that off first and then we'll come back to the steel column the next day. So that everything, what happened, we did not lose time because just because the person uh, of the boom operator or the machine operator did not come to site. Now that initially was actually controlled by the construction team in the earlier days. Nowadays, even the design team gets um, updating update on everything that's going on inside. So even the project management is totally updated. Every schedule is updated real time. Every minute the schedules are updated. So at the end of the day, what is the progress with the site? If there are drawings pending, what is the progress with the drawings are all updated and you have report on their daily basis report is there. No one has to write down or create the reports and then float it or email them. It's all on done online and it's all, all updated. So that's basically a cloud computing model which we follow for the project and it's been working pretty well because these uh, these models are we implemented for all projects. So that's for the cloud. These are the design softwares which we generally use. You have the RAM structural system. You can see that we are on the left hand top corner we have the uh, that's a concrete building that was one of the University General Hospitals in US. Right inside, there's a, one of those uh, inclined. Um, uh, it's, it was a very commercial office space. It was very, very well architected. Then in the STAD, as we all know, STAD is a very common software in India. Everyone, in, not in India, all over the world. Um, so Bentley, in fact, all of these uh, STAD and RAM structure are all Bentley products. Whereas you have the CSI products like ETABS and SAFE. ETABS is very prominent for high-rise buildings. SAFE is very good for um, your uh, flat slab or slab design. Uh, even, in fact, Bentley has RAM concept, RAM elements, RAM connections. So there are different softwares and uh, they can actually reduce a lot of your design time and detailing time. Now, coming to the detailing softwares like for, uh, for you know, for uh, the engineering, the construction drawings. So you see, we use these detailing softwares to create construction drawing. We do the 3D model. We do the connections. All these connections are all detailed out. And at the end of the day, a model like this would generally take approximately, um, let's say a model of what you're seeing on the uh, left hand top uh, corner. On the left top corner, a model like that would take approximately seven to 10 days time to complete the entire model with, uh, with the connections. Once the model is complete, these generate uh, fabrication drawings. They generate marking drawings, erection drawings, and the fabrication drawings. These drawings need to be edited as per the company, company re requirements. I mean, the drawings which are going to go outside, they have they need a little bit of editing to be done. So these drawings, and they are produced in mass scale. You can have 100, uh, 200, 300 drawings done in a day. And you must have a very strong editing team who knows how to do, you know, just rearrange the drawings, rearrange the uh, text markings, rearrange all, all, all the details, the dimensions. Um, sometimes you can actually uh, have some of your own component uh, programming modules in, embedded in these softwares and they can actually rearrange themselves. So these are all possible and we also at this office, we also have our own programming uh, modules, which I, I, we have developed in, in house. And these are all uh, like added like module components to these softwares like STAT, RAM structural, detailing softwares like Tecla, AutoCAD. So yes, you have to develop your own programming schedule because if you don't, you will be losing out your time. And again, PEB construction is all about time. So this is the basic workflow for any composite construction or PEB, whatever you want to define as. So the first thing is that the arrangement is done for any building or any, let's say any, it could be an industrial building, commercial building, residential, anything. It has been done by the architect. Now the architect, while doing the uh, line framing plan or like doing the layout, he will definitely need to know whether this form of construction is a steel based or a concrete based construction or timber. Now, steel, all these three materials which I just mentioned, they have a different architectural layout. If it's a timber, the column facing will be uh, closer. If it's concrete, it will be a little far, farther away. 
And if it's steel, you can have a column-free space, a huge column-free space. What are the spannings like? We'll come back to later. Uh, as and when the slide progresses, we have a details on that. Then the architect actually chooses the column uh, grids and based uh, in discussion with the consultant and the client in what type of material would be good for this sort of construction. If time is the main factor, steel is uh, of a dominating material. If again, cost is the main factor nowadays, uh, more or less with the economic design of steel, steel can be compared very well with different elements. Uh, we have been doing steel structures for long years. It's been more than 15 years. It has, it has actually grown in the market. People are now wanting steel, mainly because of its flexibility, because of its reusage. The salvage value for steel is very high. You can actually reuse steel. You can resell steel. You can actually shift material. You can actually move the whole entire structure to a different site location with just minor modifications. Then once the column grids and everything are concerned and, uh, you know, the grids are also based on the material availability. Material, just not the, the framing material, also the decking material. So what is the decking material? For slabs, we use something called the composite metal deck, which is where the metal deck comes with embossments. These are metal decks span. They have manufacturing spans. For example, 970 uh, yes, millimeter or particular yes. spans. These spans need to be really consideration uh, while framing out the beams and the columns. Because with, uh, I, you'll understand as and when we progress why these spans are important. Then comes the structural design and detailing part. Once the architect is frozen on the layout and the client has approved the layout, it comes to the consultant. The consultant now does the structural de detail and designing. Now this part of the detail and designing, de design and detailing is actually a lot to do with the type of construction. Now, if it's a PV based construction, my whole concept will first uh, ask the, uh, come to the point that whether the mode of uh, 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 the transportation is a trawler and the trawler length, what is the maximum length of uh, steel material a trawler can convey? Is it 12 meters? Is it six meters? What is the maximum width? Based on that, my assemblies are prepared. If my maximum width is 2.5 meter, generally that's the way a trawler is, a height of 2.5, a width of 2.5 and a length of 12 meters. If that is my uh, if that is my limitation of the trawler, then each of my assembly, which I'm going to assemble at site, cannot be more than 2.5 meters height, 2.5 meters width and 12 meters long. So that's the way I have to design it as well. My design and detailing will also follow the same methodology as that of your transportation and erection at site. Erection means what is the crane capacity you have at site. For example, if you have a, a boom with a, a crane with a boom with 10 ton capacity, a 14 ton capacity or a 30 ton capacity. So accordingly, your assemblies will be a that weight also. You can't have a heavier assembly because the assembly neither will be able to offload it from the um, uh, trawler to the site, nor will they be able to erect it. Can someone mute uh, the speaker because I think there's an external noise over here coming in. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so where the detailing, uh, design and detailing is concerned, there's a pre-construction planning required. So, which also affects the detailing part. So, my detailing and every connection, the bolted, because uh, most of the connections and everything uh, fabrication is done off-site at the workshop. So entire thing which is done on the workshop, limited welding and limited bolting. The bolting is of course there. So limited welding is kept for the site. If site welding is allowed, then it's fa fantastic because the site welding actually allows you to ensure that the material will be there for long years. Because bolting actually depends on manual usage as well. But if you have machines to give the particular torque on the bolt, then that is actually very uh, good because that actually... Um, uh, eliminates any manual error or inefficiency of a manual skin. So the pre-construction planning. Now, uh, this is the architectural layout for a steel building which we had done. Now, uh, the right side is the steel framing and the left side is the architectural layout. Why I've given in, the whole thing is actually the building, but I've just given two segments just to show how the uh, layout planning is done. So when someone, when an architect will actually uh, share with me his plan, first of all, I will generally uh, 
if you see the circles in pink those are uh, magenta those are actually the uh, this uh, column locations now that doesn't mean it's a circular column i just marked it out to just to show you where the columns are now if that's an architectural plan if you can see mainly the column spacing is raising between 6 meters now 6 meters is an efficient spacing 6 by 8 is a very efficient grading system but you can go with 8 by 8 8 by 10 if it's a steel building that's the span you can actually achieve now once you're doing this so on my right hand side is the part where i framing when once i know how to framing so when i'm doing a metal deck system a steel concrete composite as i mentioned there's something called the metal deck this metal deck is actually makes the slab span in one way for composite construction using metal deck your slab spanning is always one way so your the straight lines which you see in magenta are the um, in light or a blue if you can see i don't know what color you're seeing over there in your screen these are your beams and so are the yellow are the primary beams uh, the blue ones are the secondary beams and you can see the double uh, uh, double headed arrow that shows your spanning direction of the slab so the metal decks what you are available in the uh, on on net or available on uh, in the market are 0.8 millimeters 1 millimeter and 1.2 millimeter now, generally, we you go in for one millimeter metal deck that can span for a mil, uh, width of 2.5 to 2.6 meters, which means my beam spacing, which you're seeing over here, um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but these beam spacings need to be around maximum of 2.6 if it's a one millimeter metal deck. If it's a 1.2 millimeter, you can go up to three, 3.2 meters minimum. So, this is my first, I do the framing layout of my beam. Once I do the metal framing layout, I have to ensure that the direction of this uh, metal frame, uh, the beam should be such that if my uh, that my metal uh, deck should all the, uh, the trough of the metal deck should always be on the flange of the beam. OK, so uh, again, I, we have slides to show you that later, but this is a basic framing plan. You can just see the, the beams are also in one direction. I have not crisscrossed that so that the slab spanning is also in one particular direction. Right. And if you notice, generally, um, I would span the beam and rest it on a shorter beam. My span of the beam will be longer and resting on a shorter beam because the loads entire will be coming on this particular short, shorter beam and the shorter beam deflection will be much lower than uh, than that of uh, a longer beam. So this is my spanning direction. Uh, the, that's a beam. The one-way slab spanning direction is shown in red in the double-headed arrow. And that's the way I frame it out first once I get the architectural layout. Once I frame that, now I'm sure that um, I, the grading system which I've done or the framing is economic or not. So in commercial structures like office buildings or any malls, the uh, most economical grid ranges between um, sure, see this. Okay. Um, eight by six by eight meter grid or eight by eight meter grid or six, eight by 10 meter grid or eight by 12 meter grid. And all of these grids, if you see my beams go and span on the shorter beam, the shorter beam actually will always deflect lesser than the longer beam. So that's why it's easier and convenient and economical for me to span my longer beams. So you can ask me, but sir, the, when I give a longer beam, will not that be a, a higher deflection? Will it? No. The reason is that your uh, influence area is much lesser because of my spanning direction. So you, you even if you span in on a longer beam, the end beam, that is the mainframe beam, will deflect higher than that of a shorter mainframe beam. So basic framing pattern is very essential. This thing, once it gets onto your head, this even the architect will also frame his building in such a manner that you can end up uh, with such either six by eight or eight by eight or eight by 10 or eight by 12. But these are mainly for commercial buildings, commercial structures. Now, if it's a, if it's a residential structure, I will not go beyond an eight meter by eight meter grid because for residential structures with the loadings and uh, the um, the economy uh, part of using because if you go for a higher grid 
obviously you are increasing the column size a little bit more. In residential structures, each square feet area matters a lot. So if you're increasing the column size, your square feet area also gets consumed. And even if it may be 50 millimeter, it may be uh, 75 millimeter, it may be 100 millimeter, but that itself is a waste of space. So for residential, we don't generally go beyond eight by eight or six by eight meter grid. And in fact, eight by eight meter clear space is a very, uh, very good clear space. It's not that we have not gone beyond this in residential, but um, it's just a case study which we have done over the years and we found out this uh, structure to be my, very economical compared to the normal uh, grading system of higher grading system. So what I meant by when I say the, uh, say, when I mentioned that you have to, you have to understand how you want to place the metal deck. If you see this uh, on the top image, you have the metal deck trough, uh, the trough that is the lower part of the metal deck directly over the beam flange. So that makes it easier for you to connect the metal deck to the beam flange using the shear stud. Now, this sort of system is like a composite system where the slab and the concrete slab and the steel beam acts together as a single material and the new and acts like a T-beam. Otherwise, concrete has its own MK value, steel has its own MK value, and that two different materials, unless you integrate that, steel beam will act as a particular rectangular unit and concrete slab will act differently. So the neutral axis of this whole system, if you make them act uh, separately, the neutral axis will come down and the beam depth will increase. But if you act, if you make this into composite, then what will happen is that it will act like a T-beam and the neutral axis of the whole section moves up and your beam depth is economized, right? So to the deck, now what is the purpose of the deck? This deck with embossment, when you are using a deck with embossment, it is called a composite deck. So what does the deck do? Essentially, I, I mentioned to you that the deck actually makes the beams plan, uh, span one ways, right? So the deck is your bending reinforcement. So the beam does not need any further main reinforcement. All you need to do is in such a construction just to give the may, uh, only the distribution reinforcement on the top. That's it. For we use distribution reinforcement of, of eight dia bars at maximum 250 or 300 spacing. And that's good enough for this whole thing because this metal deck is your uh, main deck and is your reinforcement. And the embossments actually embeds or rather integrates the concrete slab with the metal deck so that they both act in unison. Then what is the purpose of the shear stud? The shear studs integrates the slab with the uh, I section or the steel beam so that the slab and the steel beam acts in unison like a composite member and it works like a T-beam. So this is basically the system of a, a composite beam and slab. Now, for example, on the bottom image, if you see the metal deck placement, if it's wrong, then you'll what will happen have you is that you'll have a trough as uh, you'll sorry you'll have a crest that is the top of the metal deck on the uh, flange of the beam what happens then you can't place the shear studs this shear stud cannot be placed any further because it's not on the uh, it's not on the beam flange and you lose the integrity or the composite action of the slab and beam at this point the shear studs are not possible to give, so it's not required. The beam acts separately, the slab acts separately. Hence, the beam depth at such location, if you place your composite decks in such a manner, the beam depth will increase, and this will is not a composite construction. It is basically a beam and slab, steel beam with concrete slab, separate construction, right? So this is your basically a, a slab and beam um, concept. Now, this is a particular uh, framing which we did. Uh, you have to understand in PB construction, we have to define the gravity and lateral framing. Gravity framings are those members, be it column or beams, which take in only vertical loads. Lateral members or the ones which are marked in red, they are the ones which will take vertical as well as lateral load. So these softwares like RAM structures, they allow you to define a member, whether it's going to be a gravity member or it's going to be a lateral member. 
lateral members because they take in bending a lateral uh, load they will go for lateral bending and hence those say, section sizes are higher whereas the gravity members are of lower section size because they only take in vertical loads no lateral uh, loads so you can actually redefine so from softwares like ram structural you can actually read uh, define these gravity and which makes the structures more economic right so this de designing can be done at the early stages and in uh, consultation with clients clients uh, mind you when you define a fray uh, a member and a column lateral you are actually converting that connection over there into a moment connection unless you give a bracing and then convert that into the column will be a uh, lateral member but the beam will not be a lateral member because the bracing will take the lateral forces the beam is only going to be taking the vertical loads which is means it's a gravity beam so now we tell the we generally speak to the architect that where we want to put the lateral framing the, the whole purpose of introducing lateral framings on the whole system is that so that to resist the deflection and the bending the deflection the drift ratio or the ratio between the far Flow to floor, the drift ratio of each floor to floor, we don't take it more than 0 0.0033. So that's the drift ratio we take. This is one of the residential buildings we had done over here in steel. This was a small residential building done in the earlier, earlier years of in our company. So, but this framing pattern is what I wanted to show you. So these are uh, different categories of spans you can achieve for reinforcement concrete flat slab. You can go with six to eight meter span, rather six to seven, uh, seven meter spanning. Integrated beam with precast, you can go up to 10 meter. Uh, then you have post tension concrete flat slab. Composite beams and slab, you can, it varies between seven to actually 15 or six, 14 meters. So. The, this is the uh, spanning you can do, unsupported spanning of slab beams. Fabricated beams with web openings is like a castellated beam. So that can actually span up to 20 meters. A cellular composite beam can also span up to 20 meters. So the composite beam said so there's a different um, spanning range and the depth uh, achieved in these different types of steel construction. These are done based on our projects and our experience in the last so many years. And these, we have found them to be uh, uh, more or less uh, true for all the projects. So this is one of the projects which we had done. Um, the, uh, the left hand side is the globe project and the right hand side is one of the pine med project in US. So these are all steel based construction. Globe project was in Calcutta. This is one of the first hollow section concrete uh, buildings of Calcutta with composite structure. This is done in around 2013-14. Uh, we completed the structure, the entire shopping mall. It's a 55,000 shopping mall in exactly direction was done in three months time. Everything complete. And mind you, it was in the heart of the city where just surrounding, just when you go outside this, it's very congested. So the entire construction had to be done in PEV mode, prefabricated at workshop and erected at site. Uh, when I meant by fabricated castellated beam, I'll just show you an example. Please look at the right side image. That's an eye section of 230 depth. And you, when you cut the profile in a trapezoidal manner, you can actually achieve on the left side is your uh, final depth. The 340 millimeters of depth is achieved with that castellated section. All you need to do is cut, take out the section and weld it in that joining points, which you can see. The central hexagonal is an opening. So these are the openings. In the top image, you can see we have used a virandal girder system where the openings are there in such a manner that any ducts and fire lines can pass through the beams and not below the beams. So basically, this is how a metal deck works. A metal deck has a shear stud. The top image on the left hand side is shows a shear stud uh, already welded. There are embossments. You can see those embossments on the sheet. And there are ribs, which are called the stiffeners. These stiffeners are actually help to uh, uh, help in the bending part of the sheet to resist the bending. So uh, the image over here in the beneficial uh, side is that uh, you place that uh, shear stud on one side of the uh, trough so that uh, the shear studs are placed in a staggered manner. If it's a single layer shear stud, you can just have one row of this. If it's a double layer, then we place it in a staggered manner. 
So the spacing between the shear stud is generally three times the diameter of stud. Uh, we generally use a 19 millimeter uh, dia stud with a, a height of 90, 90, 90 millimeter. That's generally the uh, uh, studs which we are readily available in India. And it's uh, one of those, uh, it helps in economy, economizing the design. So if you see, um, so one side of the beam is like which, uh, where the, uh, the shear stud, where the metal deck spans. So which is like given as the mezzanine end beam and the joist over here, the beam, the deck spans across that. So that's your spanning direction. And there's another beam called the main beam. This main beam is where the deck ends. And where it ends, the, uh, the trough, that's the lower part of the deck, that is the lower part of the deck, should be um, above the flange. As I told, showed you in the image earlier, that if it's not above the flange, it's not possible to do the shear studding or connect the uh, slab with the uh, beam. So that's a part of the shear studs. Now, this is a typical uh, uh, framing of a steel building, which we are it's ongoing in Calcutta. And we this is the shear studs layout, which we give. If you see on each beam, there's a bracket and it's marking of 12, which means it uh, between that span, 12 numbers of shear studs are required. And there's a maximum spacing also we give. The metal deck system, which we used over here, was of 960 millimeter, one millimeter thick and a BMT gauge of 550 with Z275 grade of steel. Now, um, this, I'll show you the how the metal deck layout is there in my next slide. So over here, uh, this, is, this is basically steel frame building. You can see the columns, the columns, and there's a cantilever on both sides of 1.25 or approximately 1.5 millimeter, uh, 1.5 meter concrete on both sides. This is because of the space constraint and um, this particular building had a, a wall around. So we did not demolish the wall. There was an old theater hall. So we just demolished the entire theater hall. The periphery 23 meter high wall was kept standing with temporary trusses on the top. And from inside, the whole building of the hopping mall was uh, built. And the whole thing uh, came up from the center with only the erections done at site. The fabrication of all these column beams, connections, everything was done off-site at the workshop. And over here, uh, just erected at site with erection bolts and welding at site. And you can see the central opening. You can see in cross mark. That's where the direct system, that's direct is a fabrication erection system. The direct system was placed in that central and that direct system had access to all corners of the building. And with that direct central system, all the members were placed in the center and the mall and the erection was done with this whole crane and the direct system, which was placed in, uh, in middle. And then all the points were accessed used for erection purpose. So this is the metal deck. So when I mentioned pre-engineered planning, it means I must have a metal deck drawing as well. Now this drawing actually not only marks the metal deck number, it also shows between what and what your which metal deck number is spanning. For example, MP metal uh, profile 103, 3250 is the length of my metal deck. And 103 is my number. And uh, sorry, 5250. And then uh, that can MP103 can be on the top, you can see MP102. That is 5090 is the length of that particular metal deck. And the number is 102. 104 spans 4.5 meter and that's why it's given a different number of 104. So this is how a metal deck number is given. So deck sheet number is MP103. You can see with the arrow marking and deck sheet length is 5250. The measure from the outer edge of the beam. Outer edge to outer edge is where the metal deck spans. Okay. So the BOQ or the bill of material of the metal deck is shown in a table below. There the part mark is given, the length of the material deck is given, and the quantity is given. 19 numbers of MP101 is required at site. So we will be marking the entire number of metal deck, where is which, which metal deck is placed where. And all they need to do is that they stack the metal deck, they get it to site, markings are done at the workshop, and all they need to do is that just place the metal deck on the beam with a tapping screw and then weld it with a shear stud. The shear studding is done using a Nelson stud gun. 
So if you see that on the left hand side, you can see the stacking and the indent markup of the metal tech on the left hand bottom corner. On the right hand top is your prefabricated hollow sections which were brought to site. Now these sections were fabricated before all they are going to be doing is that bolting it to the members and then finally welding. So no fabrication is done on site. Planning of which member, see the E member or the each beam marking is given as B12. Everything is marked separately. So each of these separate markings are uh, bought into the spans where they are going to be fabricated and then they're erected. The metal deck, similar thing with the metal deck, the markings are done on the metal deck. These metal decks, as per the drawings, are placed on the uh, beam framing of the floor. And after the uh, placing the metal deck, a tapping screw is used to connect the metal deck with the flange. The tapping screw is a very screw. It, the whole purpose of the screw is just to place the metal deck on the flange and so that the metal deck doesn't move. But it doesn't have any structural strength. The tapping screw doesn't have any structural strength. Please note that. So if you see in the column markings are given a C1 of 9.3 uh, 9 meter length or rather 9,300 millimeter. So you can see the uh, top image uh, where the column is marked in chalk with the, it's, it's actually a, a chalk or a paint which is generally used. So the, we had seen the workflow until the pre-construction planning. Once the things are metals after the whole thing fabrication is got to site, we then erect the steel frame. First the lateral and then the gravity. So that the uh, framing pattern is such because these lateral members means it, their base plates and everything are designed in such a way that if there is any sudden earthquake or sudden lateral force or wind, then the lateral members are there to take the load. Lateral frames are there to take the load. Then you position the floor deck on the beams as per the drawing. Once you position them, you can see that some, sometimes the metal deck is longer than a thing. Then you need to cut the metal deck with a uh, with uh, you know the man the electronic cutters after the metal deck is placed on the beam we place the fixed shear connectors on the beam the shear connectors are just uh, used uh, there's a video of connect how we are, how a shear connector is um, connected to the beam we'll uh, we'll just show you that video now there's a question while doing this because this metal deck is a um, deck forming we are not using, and it is actually a, also a shuttering material. Do we need props inside? Do we need props to uh, support the metal deck? That's a big question. Uh, the question actually actually will uh, be depending on the way the thing has been designed and detailed. Why? See, this is this is what this is the uh, framing. So once the, the frames are got to site, they are uh, once the framing is done. You can see on the top left hand side. The columns and the beams, all the floors are erected at the same time. It's not that you erect one floor, cast the slab and you go for the next. The erection is done complete irrespective of anything because the slab casting can be done. We do slab casting with metal deck two to three slabs a day. Two to three slabs a day. And the slabs could be between 10 to 15,000 square feet of slab. So in each day, two to three slabs can be cast. So you can see the erected framing. Once the erection is of the framing is done, on the right hand bottom corner, you can see the decks being placed over the uh, over the beams. And the span, spanning direction is basically, you can see that the central beams are there and the spanning direction is mentioned as per your drawing, as per your deck drawing. Okay. So now coming back to the cutting edge. So in the column, this is how the flange of the column will actually protrude inside the deck and this is how the deck is cut. Because if you don't cut it, you'll, the column edge will bend the deck and it will uh, create a nuisance over there. Otherwise, you can't do a composite uh, classing of slab if you don't cut it. Okay. So once you cut this based on the flange, then the metal deck can settle inside the column very easily. So this is again the image of the one of the case studies which we, we are presenting over here. Now, the central, I mentioned the central direct system of in construction. Over here on the top left hand side image, you can see the central core and the beams are kept near over there. There is a central direct system. See over here, the direct has been moved because the slab and everything have been casted. But the direct is placed centrally over here in this opening and the entire tower mass of the direct is also supported. And from there, 
all the erections are done at different locations. So once the deck is placed from below, this is how the whole thing looks like. So you can see there's a main beam which runs from the column and there's a secondary beam which runs into the main beam. And all the secondary beams have openings so as to allow your ducting material or the ducts to pass through that. Now, if you, if you understand, it is very important to save on the clear space, height of the building. So if you allow the ducts to pass through the beam, then you don't need to waste the space below the beam to pass the duct and then do the clear height, which means I'm saving on each floor. If I save by a meter of 200 or 250 millimeter or 300 millimeter in each floor, it then in four floors, I save 1.2 meter height of steel build, steel column, which is a huge. For a four-story building, if I save one meter height of column, it means a huge saving in steel tonnage. It means that even my wind pressure also varies a little uh, on the lesser uh, because of the lower height. So it's very important where you place your uh, where you place the metal deck and how you place the metal deck and the columns. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I just now mentioned to you the necessity of a prop. See the prop. If I give a pre camber to the beam, if you see this beam is bent on the towards the top. So when I'm uh, casting the concrete, the concrete is in a plastic green concrete state and it has its own weight. Because it has not solidified, it will not act as a resistant member. So the beam at that point of time acts as a singular member. In at that time, during the green concrete stage, if you don't give a pre camber, there could be chances that the beam will sag due to the weight of the concrete and maybe the weight of some of the labors walking above that. Because the concrete has not solidified to the extent it should have. Because after solidifying, it will require 7 to 15 days to gain its full strength. Because you're designing for that. So the pre-camber, the height of camber, it could be 15 millimeter, it could be 10 millimeter, it could be 20 millimeter. At the central height of camber, that will depend in de uh, depending on the design you do. You can take a, the design the camber for a certain percentage of dead load. You can design the camber for full dead load deflection or you could design the camber for dead load as well as a certain percentage of live load. So basically, if you give a camber, even after construction, then your uh, the beam will not sag due to uh, the weight of the green concrete. Now, you can ask, but sir, if the beam is um, bent, what happens to my slab? Well, no, the slab is not bent. The top of the slab is straight. And the bottom of the slab will follow the profile of your beam. So that's how the whole thing is done. Now that's the requirement of camber. So again, if you actually pre-camber that, then you don't need this shoring or the prop below the beam. But if you don't camber that, you may or may not need the prop based on the design again. So you can see that uh, how the props are placed, if at all you are planning to do so. Then once the concrete below the slab below grains 75% strength, then only you can do the propping and then the casting for the next floor, which I don't prefer because again, as I told you, I designed it in such a way that I don't need a prop. The, uh, the beam takes in the green concrete load and uh, so that I can uh, cast at least two to three floors at the same day. Left side is the shear stud gun, which is used to uh, weld the stud to the uh, beam uh, through the metal deck. The right side top corner is the tapping screw. This is used to place the um, place the deck on the beam. Left side are the shear studs uh, on the beam uh, and uh, with with the ceramic rings around it. The whole point of ceramic ring is to hold the heat generated from shear studding that welding which you see on the right hand side bottom corner. So heat generated to be confined within that ceramic. It doesn't allow the heat to flow outside that because it doesn't allow the metal deck remains intact. So on the right side, it's someone doing the shear studding at every all these studs. So if you see these studs, there are two studs placed at um, each side of the uh, central rib, which means it's a double studded beam. Now, these studs are in a slight zigzag manner. It's not in the same line. This is basically a design requirement. Once the uh, shear stud has solved
doesn't after hammering it live streaming is on so if you after 10 seconds when you hit the ham when you hit the shear stud with a hammer you'll understand whether the shear stud has gained this strength because it just takes 10 seconds for each shear stud to gain its strength right so here's actually a how a shear stud is welded um, and uh, and the heat is confined in the ceramic ring if you see the ferrule what is written at the ferrule is your ceramic ring the heat is confined with that so once you weld the thing there's a high heat generation arc welding is done and the welding heat is confined within the ceramic ring sparks can flow outside but the heat is confined and the welding of the shear stud is done um, with the beam flange uh, through the metal deck once the whole thing is done the gun is withdrawn and the uh, beam uh, the stud is in place so this is just a small video of the how the shear stud is done I'll just switch off the uh, sound so that you don't, it's not, it's a little annoying. So these are the ceramic rings which are placed and uh, uh, which are placed before because these are uh, marked in position. Once that is done, the shear stud, the guy uh, with the gun will take a stud, will uh, pin the stud in, inside the gun. I'll just... Uh, You'll see the shear stud is already inside the gun now. This is the gun with the shear stud, and he's going to weld it directly. He's going to punch it over there, and that's that. That's it. If you see that uh, the ceramic ring actually um, uh, controlled the flame within itself, and it did not allow it to go move uh, outside the uh, uh, outside the ceramic ring. So, which is why it saved the galvanized steel decking. So, this is the second uh, stud being done. So both studs, and that's the rate and that's the speed at which a shear studding can be done. And if you just see, it, the person waits for around 10 seconds to see whether the, uh, and hits it with a hammer to see whether the shear stud is actually worked or not. So then last comes the placement of concrete, preparing the slab surface and removing of the props, if any. So this is the metal deck of the building which we had done. The steel building. If you see the span, we had kept a 14 meter unsupported span. This is a basically a shopping call, a shopping mall, come move, uh, movie complex. It's a multiplex. So the, this was the movie hall area, and uh, the, there was a clear space required. This is the edge of the cantilever portion. The, you can see the periphery wall. Mind you, the cantilever portion does not rest on the periphery wall, and it's a freestanding wall. Only it gives the beams, steel beams act as a lateral resistance to the freestanding wall, uh, thereby reducing its uh, unsupported span length. This freestanding wall was uh, built in the uh, earlier days. And when we, when we built this mall from inside this whole thing, so the freestanding wall is, was uh, just standing without any support at middle levels. But as and when we uh, went on framing it out, then those framing plans and the cantilever beams were uh, supporting the walls laterally. No vertical loads were transferred to the walls. On the left hand bottom corner is your cast slab and on the right hand is the finished slab of the whole, uh, whole building. So this is, was one of the corridors of the whole movie hall and uh, the left hand side shows an unfinished corridor and the right hand side is how the movie hall now looks like. It's, it's one of the finished corridors. So this was on the movie hall, just the, uh, does the area and the cafeteria below the movie hall slope length and the left hand top complete is during the construction and post completion. You can see that's how the finishings have been done. You can't, uh, the, I mean, people actually can't make out at the steel construction inside. So this is the firstly, the entire completed mall and the steel frame. And again, as I told you, no fabrication was done on site, only erection the metal deck placement, the steel beams, the finishings of the railings, everything does done on site. No site space was used for fabrication. Uh, things were got into the place. Uh, the, the road length, the road width were all measured before so that the trawler curvature area, the trawler entrance areas could be measured from before. Long length trawlers were not used. We were using only six meter length trawlers so that it was easy for the trawler to maneuver and deliver the material at site. So these are, uh, these are some of the things you always should have because the access point to the project site, if there's a constraint, what is the width, what is the length, if my trawler can uh, bend inside uh, the area. 
So this is one of the Indian projects. This is a mall in Calcutta. If anyone, if you happen to visit Calcutta, do visit the Globe Multiplex. It's a beautiful mall. And the one, the floor you're seeing is the uh, shopping area. And the one above is your movie hall. So just the last, I'll just take another five to 10 minutes of your time. I know my time is up, but just to uh, get a short brief on uh, a different type of construction system and a PEB system we used. This is again our project in US, in Texas. So um, this is called the Pinecroft Medical Office Building. Pinecroft is the name of the place. If you see the construction site, it's a very clean site. And in the total construction period at site, there were exactly 13 labors and nothing else and cranes. That's it. There were not more than 13 labors because labor is expensive in US. We generally can't um, afford to have labor oriented construction. So PB is very prominent over there. Pre-engineered building construction where the pre-engineered planning is done off, uh, off site. Fabrications are done off site and the site is used for erection. So again, in this sort of construction, you can see the columns inside. There are no periphery columns. There are only columns inside the buildings. The periphery is a sheer wall cast on site and then fab and then tilted up. What happens? I'll show you again. A video is there. The columns are there in the central core of the buildings. And then you have the beams. The, there are main beams which are marked in gray. And then there are joists which are marked in blue. The main beams fam, uh, span between the columns. And if you see the main beams actually span up to the wall, but they don't have, they have a very small connection. That's a sheer connection with the wall. And this is actually doesn't allow, because the columns and frames are such a way, it doesn't allow uh, much load. There's a certain percentage of dead load or the vertical load, which is allowed to be transferred to the wall. And the walls are designed in such a way. These walls do, are thicknesses are ma maximum between 125 to 150 millimeter maximum. So I'll show you a video how this whole system is done. First, the columns are framed, column and beams are framed into the building, entire floor. And then the slab is cast uh, and then the walls are um, tilted up and the walls are erected. How the walls are erected? They are cast on the floor and actually in panels and they are tilted up to form a vertical wall. So the openings and everything are cast, uh, they uh, are kept during the time of casting. So you, you can see the uh, forming system. And if you see the building from top, the center, uh, these are the column spaces. You can see there is no column on the periphery. The periphery is a, it acts like a sheer wall. You have the columns in between the beams. You can see how they are spanning. We we always give beams in a, in a single direction, as I've shown you earlier also. Uh, that's the way construction are done for composite tilt up walls are on the sides and this is actually how our walls are tilted up you can see the tilting up of wall being done in one of the pictures on the top left hand side the right side top corner is actually showed a wall once it's done uh, before the framing is done there is a support system given on the wall once all the four sides of the walls are done then the support system internal diagonal support system which you are seeing on from the wall are taken off they are done just to place a, if ensure that when the wall has only one single wall uh, site is done so that those support systems are required. Once all the four sides are done, the support systems are moved. So here we have a si simple video of how a tilt up wall is done. It's done by one of these companies in US called the high tech tilt. So they show you how they frame in the um, how the panels are framed in that's the basic layout of the building and those are the uh, basic base plate points because those are going to be used so those base plates are only for the walls not for the seal columns These are the main frames of the buildings, the ground floor framing, and then there are the top floor framings also. That's the ground floor being cast. Once the ground floor is cast, um, 
it's cast on the ground. This is the wall panel system with the door and the window openings. They are now tilted up. You can see the, the openings and everything have been uh, formed online. Once they are done, they have a diagonal support system in, inside. So once that is done, so you can do the, what we do is the column framing before and then do the tilt wall system. The columns are in the center. That's how the walls are tilted up. That's why it's called the tilt up walls. These are the glazings and this is how actually we do a tilt up wall buildings in, in phase construction. It's yet to be done in India. And I'm sure there will come a time which we'll be getting an opportunity to do the tilt up wall system. It's very affordable and it's very uh, less time. It's one of those PV pre-engineered building construction systems we, it's adopted in US. Hope you all uh, had a good uh, learning and a good process of uh, a good outlook to a composite construction and different wall systems. I uh, hope the, my presentation was useful to you. Um, thank you for being there and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share these case studies. Thank you very much. Uh, Nilanjan, I must thank you that with my one request, we agreed to give such a nice presentation and surprisingly, I have also learned a lot. So really, it's a, mana, I would, uh, uh, mana, my best wishes for you for good success. Really, you have offered me a, a new concept and I have learned many new things and I think all the participants also learned uh, so many things. It was excellent presentation. I must thank you. Thank you, sir. Ramadudha. This is the very. Uh, I this, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, sirs. Um, the professors are the best place to learn. All, uh, all we learn, we start our learning from our professors. We start our knowledge from our professors, and then that's uh, we pay our our homage and our uh, what we call as Guru Dakshina to our professors. I am <laughs> my graduation is done from Bangalore RV College, so I still keep in touch with all my professors there. And I'm indebted to every one of my college professors who have actually enhanced uh, knowledge so well in me. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir, one minute, sir. One minute. Yeah, any question, and sir? Any yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sir, I am Shashi Kumar speaking. I am the HOD of uh, Vivekananda, Civil Department, Vivekananda Institute of Technology. We are happy uh, to have you today on this. Uh, webinar and uh, we are uh, uh, happy that you are a Bangalorean, you studied here and uh, and uh, thing to know is even RV college students have participated uh, in this webinar I uh, and I think we have certain questions are there, sir? a few questions can you please take sure. it up absolutely uh, yeah. what? Uh, what can you just go yes sir yes sir so what, so what are the instances of manual intervention during detailing using standard software and uh, how do we record those intervention and uh, can you please uh, explain it with an example? Um, I'm sorry, can you just uh, repeat the question? I mean, intervention, um, can you just explain what intervention you, you're mentioning? So this is actually a question posted by a participant. Sure, sure. Can you just repeat the question again, please, ma'am? What are the instances of manual intervention during detailing oh. using standard software? Okay. Uh, first and foremost, your brain is the best software you can use. Softwares like STAD are just an equipment to actually modulate your brain. Softwares are an application. What you mention, what you, the way you model is entirely to do. If you're asking me what is the manual intervention, at every point of the software is your manual intervention, starting from the method of modeling, your framing plan, what you're going to have, your end connections, your releases, the end forces you are visualizing. And before you create or run the model, you must also understand and you must have an idea what my forces or what my loads and my results are expected to be. Because if I don't have that idea of that, then I will never be able to understand whether my results are right or wrong. And if you don't have an idea, because then comes the problem. So everything has to be clear in the brain first. If you hear that what my framing pattern is, what my load paths are, and what am I expecting over there? What am I expecting a higher uh, force in that particular column joint? Am I expecting a shear, higher axial, higher bending? If it matches with yours, 
then it's fine. Your model and your run execution is fine. If it doesn't, then there are either the software has not been modeled or, or not giving the right result, or there is somewhere we have missed out in the modeling process. So that's one first intervention is uh, that in while doing the designing. Second is taking the understanding the framing requirements from the contractor. Today, as an I we speak, in the morning, we had a, a query from the fabricator that uh, one of the beams, which was to be transported at site, the trawler is not available. Then we redesigned in the first, first half, we redesigned the beam, put in splices so that it, the two, it can be uh, uh, shift, uh, transported in two modes. So that's one of the first intervention, even in the detailing software and in the designing software. I'm not sure if I could answer your question. If not, you can raise a question again. Okay, sir. The next question is, uh, can we avoid secondary beams by having decking sheets of more depth? Sorry? Repeat once again, can we avoid secondary beams by having decking sheets of more depth? Yes, you uh, see the decking sheet which I just showed you is that of 50 milli 51 millimeter depth. There are instances where we are using 75 millimeter deck and 115 millimeter deck decking sheet. If your deck of the decking sheet is increasing, uh, definitely your composite action and the beam depth will reduce. But let me tell you one thing. If you are increasing the decking depth, if, uh, if you are also increasing the volume of concrete, which means you are increasing the dead weight of the building. You need to balance it out of the dead weight and the clear space you want. There are instances which we, where we actually don't frame the decking sheet on the top flange. We frame it on the bottom flange of a built up beam. So what we do is that we use a regular top flange, a maximum of 150 millimeter, then a 300 millimeter depth beam and a bottom flange of let's say 500. So you have almost a 250 projection on each side of the web. Then you can uh, uh, span the deck uh, to the bottom flange and then your top flange will be in flush with your concrete space. That way the beams and uh, slabs are in flush. The beams don't project below the slab at all. That's another form of system. So decking uh, depth will actually govern not only your um, beam depth, will also govern your whether you can, uh, your architectural depth as, as well. Okay, sir. One more question. Is force lifting of frame component allowed at site? Is it left to the site engineer to decide the same or we have guidelines for the same? Uh, force lifting is actually, um, if you are talking about the lifting of the main frame uh, onto the site, yes, actually we decide on the hooking points and the beam also. So for example... No, so force fitting. Force fitting it is not lifting. Force fitting of frame. Force fitting. Okay. So if I'm, you are talking about the manual fitting of the bolt, uh, bolt, uh, bolting connections, uh, am I, am I right on that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So bolting can be done as I mentioned two ways, manual and, uh, with, uh, torque machines today, nowadays, uh, manual, uh, because the manual is actually dependent on the human strength and the manual skill, we use torque machines. We set the torque, the torque of the bolt is actually defined and designed earlier. Each, uh, each connection bolt torque is actually designed by you and that torque is applied at site by the torque machine and there's a calibrator in the torque machine that calibrator actually shows you whether you have achieved that particular torque that the bolt capacity torque can be of high but you don't you don't go up to that capacity because if you go up to the maximum capacity of the bolt torque what will happen is if there are unforeseen forces there could be a, a torque failure and a shear failure on the torque head of the bolt that can fail. So generally we achieve up to 75 to 80 percent of the torque value of the bolt. And force fitting done on site. If it's a bolted connection, force fitting is done. If it's not a bolted connection, if it's an even if it's an erection bolt, the fitting has to be done in such a manner that such in face of a calamity at site, the bolts don't fail. We may not have designed the uh, connection for bolt. Before even welding, there could be a calamity at site of the cyclone. What happens then? Your erection bolts also have to be designed in such a manner, but it should not be uneconomic. It has to be done in such a manner it can take in the cyclonic load. So these are uh, balances you do at site and, and, and during construction based on the height of the framing, based on the height of the building, 
where the building is located. Okay, sir. Next question: What is the maximum limit for a tilt-up wall system height? Maximum limit. And is a tilt-up wall earthquake resistant? Maximum yes. limit for a tilt-up wall system height. That's a very good question. I'm glad you asked me the question. We have not gone beyond a three G plus three story building of tilt up wall. The reason is that you can understand because you have to tilt the wall up, and the, often the tilting has a bending force in, involved. So yes, but to answer your question, the tilt up wall is actually a shear wall. The wall to wall connections are made in such a manner. It's a shear wall and it is earthquake resistance. Oh, is it an earthquake? It's a very good. Yes, it is a very okay. good earthquake resistance. One of the major reasons why is that only the wall is the only one uh, creating, giving the mass to the building. The columns and beams are steel, so that the mass production. See, your seismic forces are high only when your dead load and the mass is high, which is why the seismic forces in concrete buildings are higher and seismic forces on steel buildings are lower. So the seismic mass is generated only from the shear wall, but because of its continuity and the whole wall system. The seismic um, resistibility is very high for shear walls, uh, for tilt up walls. Okay, sir. Can we provide diaphragm and hangar type PEB structures in STAT Pro and how to provide it? Oh, yes. STAT Pro allows you to provide diaphragm in um, uh, there. Are, you can do it as a plate element, you can do it as a wall element. Uh, it's not a wall element. You, you, plate element is better uh, than. Um, uh, what, what is the other form? Surface element. So the plate elements you can actually define. So there are two ways you can define. In STAD model, um, you can actually frame out the plate element, give it the particular thickness you want. And that plate element will induce, uh, will have stresses inside. You can check the stresses and then design it uh, in a different software. We have uh, connectivity between RAM wall system, RAM elements. So RAM elements take the loads from STAD and actually design, can design the wall. In fact, RCDC, which is the advanced concrete design of STAD now, can actually design the walls of uh, shear walls as well. So uh, again, coming back, you can actually design, define the plate element. Why you need to define a plate element in a STAD? I'll give, give you a very uh, strong reason to define, design it, uh, model it. The plate element actually gives um, a resistivity to the uh, building. So if you actually Actually, model it out. Your column elements, remaining column steel column elements, and remaining steel beam elements will also reduce. It'll economize. Same with your slab uh, slab modeling. What I do generally do if it's a steel building and if I have to having to model in STAD, then what I do the walls and the uh, slab modelings in plate in STAD, because slab is actually act we we uh, we don't use uh, from action of a slab. It's a lateral frame. Each floor has a lateral frame, so the economic, the columns and beams are much economic than what we can design. If you design it as a singular frame, so the action of uh, diaphragm action, vertical wall or of slab has to be taken. Then only you can get an economic design. I'll just tell you a steel building uh, kg per square feet we we design at. A residential building we design it at 4.25 to 4.5 kg per square feet. And a commercial building, we don't go beyond 5.5 or 5.15 is our target. That inclusive of all connections, kg per square feet. But of course, it depends. I mean, there are sometimes there are high span buildings and there are long buildings with a lot of constraints and architectural requirements. Then we can go up to 6 or 6.5 kg per square feet. But that's the highest you can go. Don't go beyond that. US projects. Uh, 3.75 kg per square feet. The building which I just showed you, Pinecroft, that was around 3.575 kg per square feet. So that's the amount of steel you can consume. Okay, so, so please guide us about lifting points and its place and about guideline regarding the lifting point. Um, I just, I was mentioning about the lifting points actually. When you are lifting the... Sir, beam, uh, one minute, oh, one minute, one minute. Uh, so, so please continue, sir. Okay. Sure. So when you are actually lifting the beam, it's a reverse supporting system. 
So you're not just lifting one beam. You, when I'm talking about framing system, one beam is very easy to uh, design. So when you have a frame assembly and you want to lift it back, lift it up. So you have to fix your lifting points and you have to check those points for uh, the beam self-weight beam bending for those points because your lifting points are temporary hook like uh, uh, plate elements those plate elements need to be welded at those points where the beam will not incur any bending for example if i place the hook elements in the center of a beam where i don't have any secondary framing just in the center then the beam is likely to have a bending at that uh, thing, at that location so then what if it's unavoidable then you have to have multiple central points by bending so that it doesn't bend at the center because it's uh, simply like load applying at the center and uh, picking it up so generally it's the connection points which i generally prefer using a, a lifting point but that analysis also has to be done if it's if you're actually visualizing a frame being lifted to a 15th story or a 20th story from ground that uh, lifting point has to be fixed from before for example, we were just doing the Hyderabad airport, uh, Bangalore airport and Hyderabad, the Bangalore terminal two, which has come up. Uh, so we have done the entire baggage handling system and it's going to be inaugurated in August. So the entire Bangalore uh, terminal two baggage handling system, uh, the entire of the entire airport has been done by our company. And we've done the another uh, baggage handling system of the new Hyderabad airport, which is also coming. So over there, the, one of the biggest thing is that all the steel structures it's a hugely complicated steel structure inside the baggage handling system inside where you check in the luggage is where the last point you see the luggage once the luggage goes in through that belt and that uh, rubber curtains what happens inside is very complicated so all the structures inside are all hanging in airport structures you are not allowed to uh, fabricate structures from the ground because it has a clear space of six meters required so all structures are hanging now these structures, when they are hanging, they have to be designed for earthquake because the, there is no wind pressure. There is only earthquake. In the earthquake, they will sway. So your bracket systems and everything have to be designed in such a way that uh, it doesn't have any movement because the conveyor belt systems cannot allow more tolerance movements of more than five millimeter. So your hanging sway cannot be exceeding that. So in those hanging structures, they are lifted from the ground by hook systems from the concrete beams, and then they are placed. So our analysis has two modules. One is the design of the main structure and one is the lifting uh, points. So for example, when there's an extreme machine platform, that platform sometimes has a lifting to be done along with the extreme machine. So the entire load of the extreme machine is already on the platform on the ground. And then we lift up the whole thing. So the hooking points are then decided. And then the, of course the pulley is also designed in such a way that it uh, allows that uh, movement. So, what, which software is better according to you for PEB structures, Star Pro or ETA? Yeah, good question. Um, that's a very biased question. Don't ask me that. I am actually using all softwares. But honestly speaking, um, uh, see, ETABs, I generally use it for concrete buildings and for high rises. For steel structures in India, I think STAD is still ruling for steel structure because. Uh, STAD actually has enhancement uh, modules with RAM connections. You can directly design the connections, import the module from the steel structure in STAD, and then uh, transport it to RAM connections and get design of each, any type of connections, be it bracings, be it column beams, be it column to column splice, everything. That's number one. Number two is that the concrete design of STAD has also improved. ETABs, uh, see, ETABs was not designed mainly for earlier earlier days I'm talking about was not mainly for steel. It does steel building nowadays. And there are a couple of cases which we had to use that. But see, ETAB was earlier not used for uh, steel. I still feel comfortable using STAD for steel. But if it's composite, the best is RAM structural. It's again a Bentley software just like STAD. There's nothing replacing composite structure, Bentley RAM structural for composite. No, nothing. Nothing can replace that. It's, it gives you the most economic design for steel structures of composite. If you possible, learn that. It's a very good software. Of course, we have, we, I, I already, I'm a trainer of RAM, uh, RAM structural in uh, foreign colleges. I, so I, I go there or sometimes I impart training from here. 
So I'm, I'm part of Bentley Institute uh, also to impart training. I also teach other softwares like uh, ETAP as well, but then for composite, yes, nothing to beat RAM structure. Sir, is a tilt-up wall system economical? Sorry? A tilt-up wall system, is it economical? Um, that depends on the building height you're doing and the building for, uh, for it's quite economical. I've seen it, uh, but the, doing a tilt-up wall is not so easy. It's not casting on the ground. It's the framing action and lifting on. If you have the mechanism, you can actually do it, but it's very fast. It just, just visualize something. There's a building, there are steel columns and beams, and there's an entire uh, shell of shear wall. So the uh, shear wall will not be as thick. It will probably be around 150 millimeter. That's why you can't go for a high, high rise tilt up wall. Then that's why you shift to my band system of uh, wall, wall casting. But then if it's high rise, but then uh, for tilt up walls, um, uh, until two stories or three stories, you can actually make it very economic. Because the economic comes not only with the wall system, also the concrete, uh, st steel and beam column design you use. If we provide the castle beam in hangar PEB structure, how to calculate the mass center? Uh, please, can you repeat the question again? We provide the castle beam. Castle beam? Hangar, yes. In hangar okay. beam structure, how to calculate the mass center? Uh, for castle beam? Yes, sir. You want to calculate the mass? Yes, sir. Mass center. Mass center? See, the beam, castellated beam is a very symmetric beam. Your mass center, are you talking about the neutral axis or the mass center? It's mass center. See, the, if it's a composite beam, the mass center will depend on the thickness of the slab. If it's just a singular beam, it will act as just at the center of the beam or even a castellated beam. But if you're using it as a composite beam, then the mass center moves up. It mass center moves up towards in the center of the beam towards your uh, flange. But if you want to calculate that, actually, it's uh, if you design it as a T beam, uh, if you're talk talking about uh, there are two mass centers you can develop. One is at the uh, point of cross section of the when there is an opening, and at the point of cross section when the full section. Generally, if you want to take a critical section, then the opening needs to be taken. If you want to calculate on a conservative basis, then you have to take it in the middle of. The, uh, the solid portion and the uh, opening portion. That's a that's a balanced portion, bad balanced way. And in fact, it's the that's the actual way it will behave. That's why it's called the castellated beams. Yeah, thank you, sir. It looks like uh, we have covered all our questions. Varnashri, I have few ah, personal queries. Yeah, yeah, sir. Please, Please. go on, sir. Uh, sir, sorry to prolong it a long the question. No, no, I'm, I'm more than happy to be a part of this. Uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, my question is we talked about this diaphragm. Since yeah. we are using this uh, uh, deck sheet and the concrete thickness will be normally 100 mm max, max. But in, such a, in, in such a case, will it behave uh, and it is also connected by shear studs? In the earthquake case, will it uh, behave, uh, really behave as a diaphragm? Yes, sir. A very, very strong diaphragm. Because of its profile, um, because of its profile, it will really behave as a diaphragm. The shear studs are definitely to just to connect it to the beam and so that the whole beam and the slab acts together. But if you just consider the slab separately out of uh, um, removing every, every other paraphernalia elements, slab is that slab also acts as a very strong diaphragm. And um, because of the profile, actually, which I just mentioned now, it is actually in uh, both, there are two directions, right? One is the profile direction, one is the long beam direction. So basically, if you take away the deck sheet, your slab is actually a ribbed slab, ribbed beam slab. So ribbed beam slab diaphragm is very strong, sir. Okay, sir. Uh... I have one more thing. Sir, how do you take uh, take care of this uh, corrosion in toilet areas? Because in steel is much susceptible for that. Okay. So, um, first and foremost, nowadays, uh, these uh, these steel beams, uh, steel columns or steel elements, they, are, uh, they have two coats of primary. 
it can be zinc oxide, lead oxide. They are very strong two coats of primary uh, a primer. Once the primer is applied, then we apply a, a good coating of a lot of uh, steel paint material is available. See, the corrosion happens at the points where it is exposed to when the steel internal surface gets exposed. It's the same thing with concrete. When uh, there's a concrete enhances, uh, experiences crack, there is ingress of humidity inside and the reinforcement bulges out. Over here in the toilet areas, if you see the slab, the first your slab is your protection system between the lower beam and your um, uh, water. Now coming to the columns. The columns are adequately painted at even the uh, bottom levels. This is, this is the areas where we incur maximum corrosion. The uh, adequately painted and the paint is the only one of the only forms unless it is externally covered. A lot of places, a lot of these shopping malls, they have a board system. It's called the UPS board. These boards are also fire rated. This fire rated board actually provide also your water protection system as well. That is using UPS board. If you are not using UPS board, if you want to keep the uh, steel exposed, then paint systems are the only way you can provide your corrosions. And it is a very effective way, very, very effective way. It doesn't allow so much of ingress. And the paints are done in such a manner because the, there is a final coat of paint after all the welding is done. So that that will always help you with that. Uh, sir, one more thing. <laughs> sir, yes. in this uh, stad, you, you said you will be using the plate elements for modeling this uh, uh, slab. Yeah. Uh, how, to, how do you take care of this uh, crust and trough of this uh, uh, deck sheet? Uh, so modeling. again, uh, as I told you, for composite, we use RAM structural. STAD uh, doesn't have any deck sheet design. Uh, RAM structural has a deck sheet design. Uh, ETABS has, but ETABS is still uh, in the nascent stage. I have seen the design of both. So composite action, if you can actually, um, um, I really uh, encourage students to uh, go beyond their class hours, learn RAM structural. It's a very, very strong tool. Um, because we have prominence of STAD, both are from Bentley though, we have prominence of STAD and its acceptability in the of But all the steel building which we have been doing, we have done it in RAM structural and it's actually very, very strong. For the deck sheet, you have uh, different categories of deck sheet. You, one of your questions was the depth of the deck sheet. All are available with RAM structural. Will it take care of these embezzlements? You said the embezzlements will also have uh, certain uh, uh, benefits in design. Sorry? In the deck sheet embezzlements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The embedment is the only one to uh, make the slab act as a composite slab. So there are two types of deck sheets. Sir. One is just a sacrificial shuttering. It has just the profile. It has no embossments. Another deck sheet is the profile with embossments. That is the only deck sheet for composite. The, un, uh, the one without the embossment is a sacrificial shuttering only. They, that cannot give any composite action. This embossment, there was a very good case study done by a uh, professor of LM Gupta in BNIT Nagpur. And uh, Mr. Samanto is also uh, part of that case study uh, of MK value calculation. It has been done by INSDAC of how the MK value of that embossment and the slab is calculated. It's a very detailed calculation done. I think uh, INSDAC already has a teaching material on that. It's a, uh, it's the embossment is the only thing which actually uh, binds the con concrete with the slab and makes the slab act as a bending reinforcement. So can you suggest any good uh, uh, reference books uh, for design of these castellated beams? So castellated beams, the design, in fact, I developed myself uh, using a normal eye section. I cut it out. I, if you see my one of my slides, I just cut it out uh, in a trapezoidal way and took out, took them out, moved it and uh, joined the castellated part. So um, castellated beam design, I'm not sure whether I, I do it manually because I am sir, not very comfortable. Sir, here it. I want to interfere a little bit. Because the castellated beam, we don't have any books so far uh, to the best of my knowledge, but we have taken copyright of Steel Construction Institute UK. We are having their publication. So if you are become a, but that book, that books we cannot sell, only we can give it to our member. 
so i have to cross check if anybody of you of you become our member then we can give it free of cost but we cannot sell those books that is the limitation otherwise you have to purchase it from the U, uh, sci uk itself so okay. uh, so so they are having number of uh, publication on this cast related beams okay, okay sir, sir. Sir, uh, so one, uh, yeah. uh, in in my, one of my stats, if you see that I use a Virendal gutter system, that I in fact that system actually gives me the same depth and a much better wider opening. Castellated beams are good for with circular ducts. Virendal gutter, you can use circular and rectangular ducts together. Child, this Virendal is our old engineering system. That's a very effective one. So, so thank thank you for uh, answering all our queries. <laughs> I hope I was able to um, it, give answers. It's been a wonderful uh, lecture for all of us, and I think yeah. all the participants really they have enjoyed uh, uh, your presentation. Yeah, it, it was very because attractive, Nilanjan. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Case studies. Most of the time, we do not uh, able to uh, get the case studies to be seen because. normally we will be in a, a teaching profession and uh, most of the times we, we do not go for this consultancy uh, act and uh, we may not get that good chance to uh, uh, involve in uh, uh, the live projects i think really uh, you have uh, enlightened us i feel uh, all the participants uh, have uh, uh, earned uh, the knowledge and i am really uh, thankful to you sir it is my thank pleasure you, sir. sir thank you and thank you for the opportunity to presenting this i have more than 93 steel building case studies with me of my own stay so it's always a pleasure to help anyone if he wants any knowledge on that thank you very much sir thank you so much sir thank you very much everyone so i think sir we should close the session again we will start at 2 yes sir we shall start okay. at okay uh, nilanjan thank time. you very much again i will call you thank you sir thank you thank you sir. okay thank you sir. Uh, i request all the participants to uh, come back at 2 uh, o'clock the session will second uh, next session will be starting at 2 uh, o'clock exactly uh, kindly accommodate thank you, thank you.